since inception ethereum developers have been thinking of a robust decentralized staking model there has been multiple iteration of protocol design to reach the desired result today we are zoning in on a topic that's been stirring quite the conversation among ethereum developers ERP7251 a proposal that suggests increasing the max effective balance within the ethereum ecosystem to learn more about the proposal continue listening welcome to episode 127 of the penny where we dive deep into an ethereum improvement proposal to understand the technical aspects to gain insights into author's experience challenges and vision for the future of ethereum i'm pooja ranjan from ethereum cat holders in today's episode we will have an overview of eip7251 we will discuss what max effective balance actually means in the context of ethereum consensus why there is a push to increase it and how such a change could help get more decentralization joining us today are co-authors of eip7251 dap lion client developers at lighthouse and michael newter researcher and developer at ethereum foundation they will shed light on technical nuances the expected benefits and even the potential challenges this proposal might bring to the table welcome to p penny dap lion and mike Hello, it's good us. to be here. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We'll start with a quick introduction. Can you provide some background on yourself, how you found Ethereum and what led you to Ethereum author for EIP 7251? So, hi, I'm Dab Lion. I've been in Ethereum since 2018. I entered here by chance, but I've been very fortunate to meet a great community of people. I went into the protocol very quickly and I haven't moved since then. And yeah, I was drawn into this proposal that Mike started, uh, basically trying to block in the gaps and provide as much feedback as possible from an implementer point of view. Yeah, that's my story. Hey everyone, hey Pooja. Yeah, my name is Mike. I joined the Ethereum Foundation just about a year ago to work on some stuff around MEV and proposal builder separation and kind of quickly got nerd sniped by some of the consensus layer upgrades that we were thinking about. And yeah, max effective balance is a discussion we've been having since since like May of last year. So it's a rather old, you know, thing that we've been thinking about. And in a lot of ways, it's kind of an intuitive thing for the consensus layer to be able to have variable stake validators. And in that regard, I think, yeah, we are hoping to kind of demystify some of it today and, and talk about why why we think it's worth doing. So yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you for uh, sharing uh, about yourself and giving us a quick background about the proposal 7251. And I'm so looking forward to learn more about it. So without further ado, let's peep in. Okay, EIP 7259, Max Effective Balance. We'll start with some motivation. Yeah, so today, a big entity that controls a very large amount of stake will have a very large amount of individual keys. All of them are voting the same. So from the point of view of the protocol, that's pretty inefficient. We could have the same entity voting with a single key and casting one unified vote, and that would be equivalent from the point of view of the protocol and for choice. Next. So yeah, we could have the same security, but be much, much more efficient. Next. Why do we have this, this inefficiency? So the old sharding design, if you remember like way before tank sharding, we were going to have execution shards. Each of them was going to be a block builder. So it was very important that every single shard had an honest majority. We had to have a very high probability of this honest majority. So this max effective balance ensured that there was enough randomness in every committee so that like honest majority at the chain level would translate into an honest majority at every single shard. Next. Yeah. And, and just to quickly jump in here, this max effective balance number, it sets the cap on the amount of stake that a single validator can have in the protocol view. So it's that 32 ETH number that effectively is both the minimum amount of balance to become a validator and the maximum. So just kind yeah. of making sure that, that we're on the same page about that. So yeah, just to, to show the scope of the problem, today in mainnet we have about 900,000 active indexes, about 1 million total, uh, but only 33K unique withdraw credentials. 
So there is a very big way that we can go into consolidating all these unique entities where, I mean, even this 33K number is a very high ceiling. There's many, many entities uh, like Coinbase will have different withdrawal credentials, but, but still act in the, in the same uh, vein. Uh, next. So why do we want this? Having too many active indexes is something that will difficult us for shipping single slot finality. Uh, I will motivate in the next slide, why do we want that? And it also has an important cost to everyone operating the network. The more votes that we cast means the more attestations we have to broadcast and validate. So that increases compute costs for everyone. Yeah, and, and just to jump in here for a sec. So the reason that this kind of increases with the number of validators is that during the course of an epoch, all of those, um, like each validator basically casts a vote for the, the slot that they're assigned in an epoch. So an epoch is 32 slots. Um, so over the course of 32 slots, every, every single validator has to make a, like cast a vote on the network. And that signature has to be aggregated and like verified kind of throughout the course of that epoch. So, you know, even though Coinbase like is running, you know, essentially all their stake and they're a single entity that controls all of that stake, 100,000 plus of those signatures have to be aggregated just for them to like make their vote over the course of the epoch. So that's kind of why this, this process scales so poorly with the number of validators. Because you only have like a constrained 32 slot window during which all of this has to happen. Yeah, so I want to motivate for a minute single slot finality. This is a this is one of the end games that we want to shoot for. If you are familiar with uh, the famous Vitalik roadmap, that's over there in the top right. But with single slot finality, we would get very very fast finality times from fifteen minutes to sixteen seconds. So basically, one slot that we will have to extend for this. In the happy case, which should be the most, we will have no possibility of reorgs, and we will return higher the current forking mechanism the, the current for choice that we have which is pretty buggy and has caused a lot of headache in the past so getting there for us is, is very important it's not incredibly important that we do it today but it's something that we're going to do in some years and getting there takes time and maxi is probably a prerequisite so that's a strong motivation of why this wanna why you wanna do this timely yeah and just to jump in here the the reason that like single slot finality today is very difficult is because those like 900,000 validators that we were talking about before, if we wanted each slot to finalize, we'd need to get all of the votes from all of those 900,000 validators for each slot. So right now we have it divided over the entire course of the, the epoch, but it would have to like essentially consolidate into one single slot for all of those votes to get cast and, and aggregated. So that's like a very high bar to clear. And that's why doing single slot finality, like with the current situation would be not possible. Yeah, that's that's true. So to do single slot finality, we need less votes per unit of time. So either we have rotating sets, which has very bad downstream consequences. Uh, we have some crazy new cryptography that lets us aggregate so many things at once. Or we have less people voting. That's kind of the, the lowest tech solution that we could do today. Um, so that's where we're pushing for it. Yeah, so with regard to retiring the LMD ghost and FFG, would it be retiring or would it be more like fall fallback? Because, for example, single slot finality doesn't happen, then I think LMD ghost and FFG would kick in, as per my understanding. Yeah, that's correct. In in case of the committee voting for that specific single slot finality, don't achieve finality, we will revert back to LMD ghost. But best to not have the segue. <laughs> we can do SS7 another day. <laughs> Cool, and one last item. So another motivation that's not um, critically important, but it's, it's a great UX that we will have auto compounding and this could be really good for solar stakers. Yeah, just to kind of add a little bit of color here. So auto compounding is this idea that the stake that solo stakers earn could continue like contributing to their principal balance and earn more rewards for it in the future. So right now as a solo staker, like if I put 32 ETH in, that the way the system works is any yield that I earn on that 32 ETH is withdrawn to and, and like removed from my validator. So in the future, and so like what that means is I continue only earning my principal like remains the same size of that 32 ETH and I only earn based on that. In the future, if like if we increase the max effect balance, 
then essentially I can earn rewards on like the 32 ETH initially, and then the 32.1 ETH, 32.2. And this type of like compounding is, is really only accessible now via using like a liquid staking token, essentially. So when you buy and hold ETH right now, you, you kind of get this auto compounding feature for free because of just the note, the sheer volume of validators that, that LIDA runs, but making that accessible to a solo staker is very important kind of to help, help encourage the decentralization there. Also, as like a kind of another unique aspect of this that I like to talk about is this kind of more fine grained value that, that you can express in, in the consensus layer allows me to stake kind of more flexible balances. So if a solo staker has somewhere like more than 32 ETH, but not 64, like let's say they have 40 ETH, then right now they have to deploy the 32 ETH validator and then decide what to do with the other eight ETH. Like they can either just hold it and not earn any reward on it, or they could mint Steeth with it or Rocket Pool ETH or some other option. But with the increase in the fact of effective balance, they can just have a 40 ETH validator. So like this doesn't matter for big pools because an increment of 32 ETH is just like not that big for them. But for a solo staker, that 32 ETH increment is like a very big hurdle and having a variable balance between the two might be a very common use case. Yeah, so the core feature is quite simple, <laughs> just to put it simply. We want to take this number, max effective balance that Mike described, which delimits what's, how much balance you can have active in the protocol, contributing to votes, and bump it to some higher number. Uh, so for now, we are going for 2048, but could be more, could be less. Next. And a really, really common misconception yeah. here is that this will increase the minimum balance to become a validator. But that's mm -hmm. actually not the case. So we're keeping the minimum at 32 so that like it's still as accessible as it is now to run a validator, but allowing a much like wider range of, of stakes to be represented by the validator balance. Cool. So just raising the balance, we want to make sure that all of these invariants are kept safe. So for the first one, the fourth choice, everything is scaled by effective balance. So we don't really have to do anything. Uh, for the next one, shuffling selection also, likely everything is already scaled by max effective balance. So the protocol is safe as is. We don't need to change anything at spec. Maybe we need to use higher random bytes, but that's a technical detail. Uh, I think you can skip a couple now. And uh, then for the, for the third, for the security of committees. So as we we're saying before, the original point of this limit was to make sure that the committees were honest majority, in a, but it's a very high probability. That's no longer a requirement. But in the current design, we still need to make sure that enough aggregators in every single subnet are honest. So there is currently a lottery that selects 16 aggregators per subnet, just based on the count of how many participants are on the subnet. We are now going to change that into being balance-based so that we can make sure that like honest, non consolidated participants don't get overrun. The second one is the churn. We must make sure that active and exit churn invariants are kept. Now they will have to be balance-based and it's actually not too complicated. We will have these neat variables that we are displaying here in the state. Uh, one interesting point is that today, the top-ups go around the churn and that's acceptable because your range of balance that your validator can go is only from 16 to 32. So not much stake can escape this. But with this, the amount of stake that could go through top-ups is very significant. So they will have to be put in a specific queue. Yeah, the design is not too complicated, but it's an interesting point. Uh, next. Oh, yeah. I'll just add one little thing here. So the churn is the mechanism by which the rate at which the validator set changes is controlled. So the, the important thing here we're trying to preserve is this kind of this idea of accountable safety, which is that if one third of the validator set commits, you know, a slashing violation, like they do something that in the view of the protocol is, is slashable, then they'll be slashed. Now, this kind of sounds fine in theory, but it's hard when you have a validator set that is like potentially constantly changing. So the way to control for that is we say, okay, only a certain amount of validators can churn through the protocol in a unit time so that we know that this safety property is like one third minus a tiny epsilon, which is like the amount of the amount that the validator set can change over a certain period of time. So that's kind of the, the context of what this churn is. And right now, the way the churn is set up is based on number of validators. 
So it's it's something like, okay, during each epoch, each epoch is a couple minutes, there can be like eight new validators in and eight validators out, something like this. Obviously this works right now because all the validators have the same balance, which is that 32 ETH. In the future, the churn has to actually be like the, the unit that we're measuring the churn in <clears throat> can no longer be number of validators because the validators can have very different balances. So it's actually going to be the amount of ETH coming in and the amount of ETH going out during a unit period. So that's kind of the important distinction. And it makes it a lot easier to, well, yeah, it makes it better to represent these different size um, validators because you don't want like 10 gigantic validators to come into the protocol and change the distribution of stake very meaningfully if only like, you know, one of them should be consuming a lot of the churn for a number of epochs in a row. So that's kind of the point of this and why we have to pay attention to these these invariants that we preserve through the, the protocol. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, we also went over this, so that's the next. Cool. Yeah, I'll talk a bit about in-protocol consolidation. So this is this idea that for entities that are running many, many validators presently, they need a way to consolidate those validators into a single validator that has a much higher effective balance. And the reason for this is because if that, like in this context here, we have Alice, she's a pool node operator. She has four validators, one through four. If she had to exit those four validators and then re-enter them through the protocol, though that stake would not be earning rewards during the like the withdrawal period and during the activation period. There's there's a few nuances there, but basically what this would mean for the pool operator is that in order to do this consolidation, they'd have to sacrifice some amount of rewards that that stake could be earning during the time that they do this this process. So one of the key features that the staking pools requested and that kind of would facilitate them to make use of this EIP would be if we provide a way for them to consolidate through the protocol. And this kind of situation is very simple. It's like you want to be able to signal that these four validators are logically the same and then can be merged into a single validator that's controlled by like one set of validator signing keys and one withdraw credential. Um, just to take a like a bit deeper look into this. So the the consolidation flow is best understood in comparison to a voluntary exit because the they look kind of highly similar. So just running through the voluntary exit flow kind of sets the stage for the in-protocol consolidation. So in a voluntary exit, a validator is basically marked as having an exit epoch and withdrawal epoch. These are two kind of two of the attributes that describe validator number 42 in this case. Once the validator hits the exit epoch, they no longer are contributing to the protocol. They're not proposing blocks. They're not signing attestations. And once 256 epochs past that have elapsed, this is on, I think this is like about one day of time. Once that has elapsed, yeah. they their stake gets withdrawn to their withdrawal credential. So yeah, this is kind of like how the process works for a voluntary exit. This is like, if I as a solo staker signal that I want to leave, this is how it works. Now, the reason we kind of went through this is, oh yeah, and just kind of looking at the timeline here, like kind of map, mapping the flow into a specific set of time, we have this period during which the validator is active and they're still signing. This is kind of before we hit the exit epoch. After we hit the exit epoch, but before we hit the withdrawable epoch, the validator can still be slashed, meaning if someone submits proof that they double signed a block or they double signed an attestation, then they can be slashed. But they're during this these epochs here, they're not actually you know, they're not actually signing new attestations. These are just old attestations. And this allows the protocol to kind of hold them accountable for anything they've done in the past. So that if they do something bad, they can't immediately leave and not get slashed. Now, kind of bringing it back to the in-protocol consolidation, we have this slightly new version where if we have two validators, so we have validator 42 and 43, and we basically want to merge we want we want to merge validator 42 into 43 so we have like the source so the source of the the consolidation and the target so the source is being exited um, and this is why we talked through the with the voluntary exit because essentially what we do is we we mark their exit epoch and their withdrawal epoch the same as we did in the voluntary exit case and once that epoch is hit then their balance is applied to validator 43 so there's kind of like one additional step that i left out of this diagram because it's already like there's already kind of a lot going on but that last step actually shuffles all of the stake from validator 42 and applies it to for validator 43 so at the end of this situation 43 would have 64 eth 
and validator 42 would be fully exited from the protocol. And kind of taking that same timeline diagram from before and applying it to this situation, we have our source and our target. So again, source in this case is validator 42, target is 43. And we can see that during this period here between when the consolidation operation is included in a block and between that and the exit epoch, everything is, is staying the same. So the source still has 32 ETH staked and is still 32 ETH slashable, same for the target. Now, this period here is still constant at 256. This is like the same value that we have today, nothing changes. But during this time, the source only has the slashable ETH. They don't have any ETH staked. This is because they're not participating in consensus anymore. The target stays the same. And then once the withdrawable epoch hits, which is 256 epochs later, the source is fully exited from the protocol. And now we have 64 ETH on the target. So this is kind of like, I guess, like the three stages consolidation and as they work, as it, as the time elapses to, to make sure that, you know, no one can get around this slashable time period by doing a consolidation. So we still hold them accountable. We still have this accountable safety property preserved, but we allow them to merge validators without actually exiting the protocol. So yeah, this is kind of like one of the key features that is is needed. And, you know, for that reason, we thought it would be useful to go into some technical detail here. Do you want to talk about this chunk or do you want me to line? Sure. So yeah, this clarifies what you just said. Like one of the... I think important conclusions that we had designing this AIP was realizing that the, the consolidation must go through the churn. Otherwise, we don't have this accountable safety. Because in practice, a consolidation, no matter how you put it, it's an exit and an activation. Stake can move around and it must be a slashable. Otherwise, it's possible that there could be a double, double finality. So yeah, like the good mental model is this one. We must consider like a consolidation as a safety reaction of 2C. And this one goes into more detail. I think when we can skip, we are running a bit over time. So yeah, if you want to, there's a document on this that, that outlines some of these questions. So yeah, definitely yeah, take a look there. The most important point is understanding that now consolidation will take time. So just go to next. So at the current level, we will take about two years to consolidate, which is significant time. So going back to the original motivation, if we want to ship SSF at some point, we must consider that it will take significant time for all the stake to turn into a more manageable number of active indexes. Cool, yeah. I'll just run through these kind of two other features that we want to talk about. One of them is this custom ceilings thing. So this allows validators to basically specify a different level of stake at which the sweep will kick in. So right now, the, the 32 ETH max effective balance indicates that after 32 ETH, any stake that accrues is immediately withdrawn You know, in this, in this rotating process. So every two weeks or so, that ETH is swept off and sent to the withdrawal credential. Custom ceilings allow validators to specify the point at which the sweep, the sweep kicks in. So for validator one, they have the sweep kicking in at 64 ETH, validator two has it at 32, and validator three has it at 96. And this just allows kind of more fine-grained control for people to, to allow them to some value for their validator without worrying about like having to custom do the withdrawals whenever they want them. They still get this kind of like automatic sweep process that withdraws their ETH, but they get more flexibility over what value that happens at. Yeah, another kind of core feature here is this thing called EL triggered partial withdrawals. We won't go too much into this, but there's an EIP uh, called 7002, which allows the withdrawal credential to initiate an exit for a validator. And this is important because ultimately the withdrawal credential is the place, is the owner of the stake that the validator runs. And oftentimes there's kind of a separation of concerns here where someone gives access to the stake to someone else for them to run the validator but they still want to have control of the stake that they own in, in terms of like when the ETH is withdrawn from the consensus layer. So triggering the exit from the withdrawal credential kind of makes intuitive sense. The reason we want to allow the, the withdrawal credential to also trigger a partial withdrawal is because we don't want them to have to exit the validator to get access to some of that ETH. So for example, if you're running a, a, a validator with a thousand ETH and you need to withdraw five to pay for your taxes, then we want to be expressive enough to allow that to happen without having to exit the full thousand ETH and re-enter it and go through like the whole churn process that we were describing before. So this is kind of a subtle but important feature that 
that would get bundled in with this EIP and it kind of extends and overlaps with 7002 very nicely. Cool. Yeah. So that's, do you, do you that's want to talk about the, that? Yeah, yeah. So that's all about the features. I think we close it pretty nicely. That's why we call the, the core EAP, just raising the max effective balance to allow the possibility to have lower indexes. But just being realistic about how big the, 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 the current set is, that's why we want to have consolidations because we cannot expect the current set to ever be used otherwise. And we want to have all these nice UX features so that this is actually usable. Uh, otherwise, people will be stuck, as you say, with, with ETH that is not accessible until you do a full exit. So the point I'm going to talk about now and ties to the question we'll do later is, will people consolidate? One of the main critiques of this feature is that no, because slashing risks are worse. I want to dispute that. So here, just bear with me for a second. Let's model how a classic slashing event happens due to operational error. So at some point, an operator will run keys twice. That's the classic reason to get slashed, assuming you are not a malicious or attacker. Some point later, there you will be slashed. There will be the first time that the network diverges and key like setup A will sign specific route, setup B will sign different route that will be slashable offense. Hopefully you have some sort of alert. That's what most professional operators have at the moment. So sometime later you will stop the setup. So you have this initial guaranteed slashing of some amount of keys and then some other slashing that happens until you actually stop the setup. So really the the slashings between T1 and T2, what happens post the initial slashing, though that's proportional to, to your indexes. So consolidation doesn't matter. On, the only thing that's important is that initial guaranteed slashing. The more you consolidate, the bigger that, that spike is guaranteed to be. In the extreme case where you consolidate all your stake into one index, you will get slashed 100%. And this is what this chart captures. It runs a binomial comp computation over that simulated model and shows that very quickly, at uh, like 100 to 100 indexes, your risk is plateaus to as many keys as you want. So for big operators that are running thousands of keys, consolidating to some factor that goes into that limit of 250 should not alter the risk. So say that like Coinbase is running 100,000 keys, they consolidate into, I don't know, 50,000, 20,000, just by a factor of two or five. They are still way above this limit. So their risks factor in this specific scenario should not be altered. And even beyond this, one of the parts of the EIP that, that we're kind of continuing to discuss is this idea of reducing the initial slashing penalty to zero. So there's kind of this whole range of things that happen when you get slashed. There's this initial penalty. There's a correlation penalty for kind of trying to track how much ETH was slashed during a given period. This is the whole like accountable safety thing. And one additional way we can really reduce the risk of slashing is just making that initial slashing zero or a constant that's like low enough to not be significantly risky for large operators. So there's kind of a, a defense in depth type argument here that flashing risks can be greatly reduced across the board to help incentivize and encourage consolidation. Yeah, I think that's what we're touching here. So, oh, gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. If you want to summarize, so Mike has been in contact with Paul, so you have a bit more insight. Yeah. So a lot of discussions with with different staking operators and kind of trying to, to make sure that both they understand what we're doing and why, and it makes sense for them to kind of contribute to the design process because the, the real reason this EIP is there is to reduce the consol or reduce the validator set. And so if, if they don't make use of the consolidation mechanism, then it's kind of like a no-op, like the EIP is a lot of change to the protocol that doesn't actually do anything. So yeah, the, the biggest thing is the slashing risk, which we were talking about making that initial penalty zero, this kind of defense in depth argument that even if there is some risk of getting slashed, like that risk scales as you run many validators, it, it kind of goes to zero or it doesn't, it's not meaningfully different if those validators are consolidated or not. Again, this very low one-time cost thing is about the in-protocol consolidation. So this is making it very like as easy as possible for them to just say, okay, we're doing this one-time thing where we're consol consolidating our 100,000 validators into 20,000. It'll be slightly annoying, but it's like good both for the long-term sustainability and health of the network. And also in terms of that last bullet point there, which is long-term cost reduction, potentially it could just simplify a lot of the things that go into running a large node operator, right? Like right now, key management and like mapping a number of 
of validators to nodes is quite a complicated process, right? So in the just the fact that like one node on the network could be running like a thousand or ten thousand different validators with different keys kind of in, introduces some amount of complexity and um, that could be reduced if you just had one node, all of the stake on that node was con controlled by a single signing key. That single key was like running in an anti-slasher protected mode. Like all of these, all of these considerations could could make it a lot easier to run a big staking pool. Yeah, just to, to nail on how low the one time cost is. So they will be offline for the 27 hours of the withdrawability delay. So that's about one day. So you would lose one fraction of 365. So it's basically nothing. It should not be even noticeable. So I think that would not be a complaint for the benefits that you get in the long term and the contribution to the protocol. Yeah. So I'm going to touch quickly about implementation complexity. So I've been doing a proof of concept in Lighthouse of DZIP. I'm maybe 70% done. I want to say it's mile-ish complex. It's not too bad. Like DZIP is mostly state transition. And those changes are very easy to test and implement. They don't, it's very deterministic. Um, and yeah, so complex things are touching the validator client and uh, things like networking with DZIP doesn't touch at the moment. So the most complex item at the moment is changing the ease aggregator function, which requires reworking a bunch of committee caches, which are very optimized and are somewhat complex to, to change in that regard, but it shouldn't be too bad and it's quite doable. So the last point, and I want to touch now that we are in EIP decision season, is this EIP time critical? Should we include it for Electra? It depends on these variables that you consider. So if you are worried about the effects that very high levels of stake would have on the network and how clients will handle, then this EIP is somewhat time critical. If you care about SSF and it being included in like some reasonable amount of time, then yes, this, this EIP is very time critical. Yeah, and it, 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 it's worth just saying that, you know, the amount of validators kind of plateaued at 900,000 for a while. And Lion and I were talking before the call, actually right now the validator queue is full again and we're kind of back in the version of the world where the number of validators in is increasing regularly. And there are definitely optimizations that can be made to handle these different you know, loads. Like right now we're at 925,000. If we get to like 1.2 million or 1.5 million, like some significant optimizations might need to be made to the, the clients. And when that happens, like not only are you introducing risk by changing the code, but you're also consuming bandwidth that could have been going to other things, right? So like, I think we should view it as something that is both tech debt in terms of the kind of core design of the protocol, like in the specification, but is also like kind of this incurring tech, like tech debt in the clients that we have to maintain and optimize them further and further for handling this like massive load validators and, and messages over the network. So yeah, I think it is time critical. I think it, it's an EIP that kind of intuitively makes a lot of sense for everyone. It's just about like getting on board and committing to like making this, like paying down this tech debt that's from the historical context. Yeah, and then I'll just run through like a, a quick list of pros and cons to kind of summarize what we've been discussing here. The immediate pros are, we should see an initial reduction in the validator set. Like we, we know that some people will consolidate. We also have this kind of longer term future compatibility, which we were just talking about in the previous slide, like single slot finality, long-term network health. And just if, if you kind of think intuitively about a proof of stake system, it's very obvious that validators are gonna be having different balances and those should be represented by the protocol. Additionally, there's this improved solo staking experience that we were discussing before as far as both auto compounding and variable balance. So like staking some amount between 32 and 64 ETH or between 64 and 96, for example. And then the initial kind of like super high level cons is that we're not guaranteeing or incentivizing consolidation. So I think the biggest thing here is that if we put this into the protocol and no one chooses to consolidate, or let's say only 1% chooses to consolidate, then effectively it's kind of a no-op. Like we still have 900,000 validators and generally speaking decisions around the core protocol are made to accommodate like the worst case situation, not necessarily the average case or the case where we're like depending on people's kind of altruism to do something. So that's that's a valid concern. I think that concern doesn't stick with me too much because we have been so in the loop with the staking pools and we know that we would like have some commitment on their end to help 
preserving the health of the network and, and doing this, even though it's kind of not directly incentivized for them. Also, it's worth mentioning that we are like trying to conduct some research to, to think through what an incentive me mechanism could look like. The problem with most of these things is that they end up like being less credibly neutral, right? If you do something that favors the large stakers, it's just going to further push people to to stake with the large staker because there's either increased rewards or like a slightly smoother UX or whatever. And that's kind of like, we're doing everything we can to make sure that the solo staker can contribute meaningfully to the network and that we have that kind of like long tail of decentralization. So that's what makes this incentivization kind of difficult. The second con is just engineering effort. Like there is, you know, lines doing such an awesome job of prototyping it to kind of help us I guess, get more clarity on what it looks like from the, from the client dev perspective. But there's like, this would consume some of the bandwidth in Electra, like for sure. And deciding if that, if that bandwidth is best allocated now or, or in a later time, based on the time constraints that we were talking about before is the core decision for whether or not we should include this EIP. Well, another point I want to mention is we have two sides of the study. So we want to see existing state consolidate, but we will have new state onboarding onto the network. And this new stake can choose to consolidate or not, even with a lighter version of the EAP that doesn't have all these consolidation features built in. So, and this, this, new, this new stake coming in, it, it should not have any problem consolidating. And yep. I don't know, like, if, yeah, if crazy things happens, like ETF staking comes in and we have like 50% of ETH stake, like this is very relevant. And definitely contributes to the time criticality because then all this new stake doesn't have to consolidate and can like enter into the network with this like optimal ideal form that we want to see on the end game. Yeah. Yep. Great point. Thanks. Cool. Yeah. That's the end of our presentation. Happy to take some Q and A. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you for the talk. It was interesting to learn about the positive side effects and know that it is also helpful for a future design a single slot penalty. It was really interesting to follow the protocol consolidation with model. And great to know that there are outreach efforts to connect with big staking pools and large node operators already. I understand EIP 7251 does not require any change to the execution layer, but it is interesting to know that uh, one proposal to increase the max effective balance is also suggesting simple yet significant uh, changes to consensus layer that could be really helpful to add more new stakers. Well, the presentation already covered my basic questions. <laughs> I may have a few more, but uh, at this point, I would like to open the floor for participants of the call if they have any questions for the guest. Yeah, I get a question. Is the reuse of the indexes also in the scope of this EIP? No, that's a completely separate EIP, out of scope. But is it planned to be included around the same fork or will it be too many reworks for yeah i would personally argue against i think reuse indexes is something we should do eventually but maybe like in five years but definitely not now and you were mentioning that session would be bigger could you quantify that in terms of number of ETH per slashing event with like current minute numbers like let's say you consolidate uh, three nodes to yeah, 96 ETH and you would get slashed would it be like three ETH, because right now, if you see someone getting slashed, it, it's approximately one ETH per slashing event. So would it be approximately three times that? So the proposal actually gets rid of that initial penalty altogether. So for a, a solo staker to get slashed would be essentially zero ETH. They still get the other kind of penalties, which are associated with like inactivity and also the correlation. If many people are slashed at the same period, then there's that penalty. But in both the, the 32 ETH like three thirty-two ETH validators and one ninety-six ETH validator, if either of those got slashed, kind of in isolation, the penalty would essentially be zero for both of them. Um, just a follow-up there. I want to make sure this, like this initial penalty to zero, is this part of the present EIP or is it a proposal that we are expecting in future? It's part of the current EIP. Uh, my question on this is that uh, since you know. A person will consolidate, for example, his thousand validators into one validator and they will get slashed. So actually what has happened is that the coordinated slashing has got absorbed into this one particular validator. And now they will basically, so that part of slashing has, is somehow vanishes because 
there is no coordinated validator, second validator to for that uh, part of the penalties. So in that way, basically penalties have reduced, right? No, not, not quite. So the way the correlation penalty works is you get slashed and then there's kind of this window of time that elapses and both like a set of time before and a set of time after when you slashed, when you were slashed, it's tracked how much total ETH was slashed during that period. So the moment you get slashed, like let's say you're the, like a 2000 ETH validator, the moment you get slashed, the amount of ETH slashed in that period is 2048 ETH, for example. And then, so like your own weight contributes to the correlation penalty insofar as like you increase the amount of total ETH, cumulative ETH that was slashed in that time period. Does that make sense? And then the one kind of cool thing about this, even as a fully consolidated validator, if you get slashed in isolation, the correlation penalty will probably be zero too. Like the correlation penalty doesn't kick in until like 1% of the network gets slashed. So it needs to be essentially like a mass slashing event for that correlation penalty to start. And in general, like we we don't want that to happen for isolated incidents and it, and it won't happen even if people consolidate their validators. No, I mean, I'm assuming that there is a big uh, operator who has significant percentage of the network and uh, their singularity is slashed. So as per you, it will still get the coordinated penalty because their weight counts towards it. Yes, that's for sure. Since we're setting the, the max at 2048, it's not like someone could consolidate like into a single validator that controls 1% of the stake. Like, you know, it the in terms of percentage per validator key that a validator would have, it's still like much, much below the amount that contributes to the correlation penalty. But yeah, it does contribute, the stake within that window does contribute to the correlation penalty, yes. So I have a non-technical uh, question, which is what scope would you want for Electra inclusion? Would you basically just want straight transition included? Would you also push for a consolidation mechanism? I will go for the full package because otherwise the CIP is, is weak. We rely on making sure that people will consolidate, otherwise it's a no op. So shipping something that's not appealing, I don't really see the point. And from my experience implementing it, the extra feature doesn't add too much complexity. So I don't really see the point on just shipping something halfway. Yeah, the kind of, I guess the blessing and the curse of this is that like the core features are the ones that are the complexity. So shipping mm -hmm. the other stuff that like makes it useful is probably worth doing because like taking the consolidation mechanism out, for example, just doesn't simplify things that much. Like we, we talked a lot about it and spent time aligning it because it's a complicated and important piece from the like intuitive setting, but from the actual spec change, like the consolidation mechanism is like, I don't know, 20 lines or something. It's just not worth excluding just for the sake of, of reducing the total scope of the, of the proposal. So a small follow-up follow question on that. So if, for example, a validator has 10,000 ETH and max he can consolidate to zero or eight or whatever ETH into one validator. So basically, the automatically his ETH will be consolidated into X number of validators, whatever he has, right? I'm not sure I followed the question. Did, did you catch that line? So our operator has, so I'm assuming that you're consolidating by withdrawal address. Mm-hmm. So if a yes. validator has, for example, 10,000 ETH that he pointed to a withdrawal address, if an operator has 10,000 ETH pointed to a withdrawal address, and how many basically, so the protocol itself will ensure that how many validators will be consolidated into depending upon oh, the Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, sorry about, uh, so we, we didn't communicate that part well, I guess. Um, the It's not automatic. There's no like automatic consolidation process that happens. It's still something that has to be opted into by the validator. So like if a bunch of ETH is pointed to the same withdrawal credential, we the protocol like exposes an interface for them to, to signal that they want to do the consolidation, but the signature and the like voluntary action still has to be made by their by their signing key. Yeah. So you don't need to exit at all. You will be able to just consolidate into a single validator using some tool. Okay. Yeah, and maybe something we didn't point it into the presentation. As of consolidation, we had different designs of who could consolidate. Initially, we wanted to allow anyone to consolidate into anyone, but that involves extra complexity. So the current design allows to consolidate only within records that have the same withdrawal credentials. 
and that allows us to completely bypass authorization from the withdrawal credentials. That's a bit more complex. Uh, it's it's a limitation, but it should cover like the vast majority of cases that actually want to consider it. I think I have a question around a churn invariant. It was mentioned in the proposal that there could be churn variants in future. I'm just trying to understand, is it based on uh, speculation uh, or is it something that we may expect uh, with a future proposal? Yeah. The churn changes are part of the, like that's kind of the core, one of the core pieces that has to be in the EIP. Because of this whole, you have to rate limit based on amount of stake versus number of validators, that whole distinction. So you kind of change, I guess you change the unit in which we measure validator flow through the protocol. And yeah, that that's something that isn't speculative. Like that has to be part of the core design. Yeah. I think everything we presented is in the in the core design. And it's like Line was saying, it's kind of all or nothing. Like these features don't really make that much sense in isolation. Like they kind of all have to go in together to, to be maximally useful. All right. I understand that part. But sometimes I I have noticed that it becomes difficult for a proposal to go in if it comes with so many features. And it is always better to like take out feature by feature into different EAPs. All of them can be separately considered. However, I really hope that uh, it, it goes in as a package because we have enough time for Electra upgrade and perhaps we can do some more outreach to make sure that people are open to adopt this proposal if implemented in the core protocol. I have one question uh, with respect to the downtime. Uh, if I remember correctly, there was a mention of 27 hours of down. When is this time? Is it going to be at the time of deployment, the mainnet upgrade, or what, when is it going to be? Sure. So as Mike was saying, consolidation is an, an, an action that you have to express to the protocol via a new operation that you will submit as part of the block. When you submit this consolidation, you would be and scheduled into this consolidation queue. And that's when you will start to incur these 27 hours of inactivity. After these 27 hours have elapsed, plus the churn, which hopefully should be zero, then you would be activated again into the target consolidated validator. And just make sure we're all on the same page. This isn't like downtime of the network. The, the network doesn't go down at all. This is just saying during the time at which a validator is consolidating into another validator, there's 27 hours during which they won't be earning rewards for their stake. And that's kind yeah. of like the minimum amount that we can do with this design of the consolidation feature. Yeah, and to be precise, they will not be penalized for inactivity. They will just not have the option to accrue rewards. That's interesting and good to know that it's not a downtown of the network. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be crazy. <laughs> <laughs> of course, 27 hours, big amount. <laughs> All right. All right, uh, we are about time. I'm just trying to wrap up over here. What advice would you give to someone who wants to contribute to the Ethereum ecosystem, even if they would like to make the contribution through the proposal like 7250? Okay, yeah, I'll go and then I'll pass it off to you quickly because I'm still learning this myself, like trying to figure out how the whole EAP process works and tying it with the research side. So I guess... From my perspective, I've, I'm kind of probably coming from a very different perspective than Lion, but I like to kind of like try and write and communicate first and then go kind of towards the, the spec and like EIP process. So I think ETH research is like a great place because it's, it's super easy access, like not even just starting with posting, but like posting the own stuff, but also like commenting on the existing proposals, I think is like probably the, the lowest barrier of entry possible. And then I guess the consensus specs are what I'm most familiar with. So I'll kind of comment on that. And I found that they're way like less intimidating than I actually realized, like just getting in there and being like, okay, what is the state transition function? Like, what is the churn limit like and it's it's all in python code it's like super readable if you have some amount of, of software experience and yeah i think hopefully it's like very easy to to jump in and then and go from there i'll pass it off to line yeah i want to say from from my experience of interacting so the ethereum foundation runs this program called the ethereum protocol fellowship which is exactly aimed at this to try to onboard people onto the core protocol and also into research and it can definitely feel very intimidating. Like these topics are very complex and you need a lot of background knowledge to make sense of, of what is going on. And usually the materials can feel intimidating. But I will encourage everyone that, as Mike says, like the specs are open and very accessible. 
uh, E3 search is also open and, and accessible. So read materials. And if there is something that interests you, you can hop into the ETH R&D Discord and just write to the authors and say, hey, guys, do you need help with this? Is there anything that we can contribute? Because we definitely have many like open ends that we would like to put time in. Maybe like there is some specific conclusion that we would like to have certainty or someone running the numbers and do a simulation to make sure that our hypotheses are good. We may not have the time to do that and we would definitely appreciate the help. And those little tasks are something that it's much more accessible and that it can serve as like this first step in uh, for someone to, to take into research and like you will develop these relationships. And I think it's a great way like to enter the space. Very well said. Uh, it's really encouraging for, for uh, new people to maybe jump in by the process that you have already suggested. And it, it's really helpful to know that the, the process may look intimidating from outside, but it is not in real world. And I'm sure Barnabas here may use some help on writing test cases for each of these proposals for having them on DevNets or on the public assets. So yeah, people, if you are listening and if you are open to support, contribute, please feel free to jump on ETH R&D Discord. That's the best place to begin with, with whatever you want to go ahead and do that. Yes, please go ahead. And can we start testing? Do you have an implementation <laughs> ready? It's getting there. It's getting there. Okay. Next week then. All right. Very well. For those uh, new to the proposal EIP 7251 in particular, this is catching eyes uh, of many people due to its potential implication on uh, network security, validator incentive, and overall economics of the Ethereum proof of stake mechanism. So whether you are a seasoned Ethereum developer, a curious enthusiast, or someone fascinated by ever-evolving world of blockchain, I hope this episode would provide valuable insight into one of the most talked about proposals in the Ethereum community. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Lion, for joining us here today. I hope the proposal gets accepted as is in the Electra upgrade, uh, but it, we have a long time to maybe evaluate the proposal even better and go ahead and make sure uh, we are trying to include everyone. Big uh, validator, the solo validators, and may be able to create a space for someone new to join in as well. Thanks so much for having us. It was a blast. Yeah, thank you so much. On this note, thanks to all our YouTube viewers for watching and podcast subscribers for listening to the special episode on Electra Upgrade at eCathodist channel. Should you have any question on this or any other topic, let us know at eCathodist Discord. Check out description for more info and stay tuned for more upcoming talks. Until next time, keep watching, keep listening and keep sharing your love with Ethereum Catherine. Thank you, everyone.